of last year's championship game. One final George shooter. 10-5 Princeton. With 11.50 to play now in the first half. Don McDonough along with Clark Kellogg. Delighted to have you with us from Chadwin Gymnasium in Princeton, New Jersey. Duncan has a man open. Lee Perry passed it up to Duncan for three off the back iron. And Eastwick, who's been a force in the early going, ripped down the rebound. Tempo clearly the way Princeton likes to control the game, keeping it at their pace, and so far they've been effective, but they've been active defensively. There's one of their patented backdoor cuts. Miller went backdoor, but the pass did not connect from Henshin, and it's a rare Princeton turnover. Bob Wenzel's club trails by five with 11-19 to play in the first half. This telecast is an exclusive presentation of creative sports marketing in association with ESPN. Any use, rebroadcast, or other transmission of this game without the written consent of creative sports marketing and ESPN is prohibited. Rutgers off to a four start, shooting two for seven. They've attempted only seven shots in eight minutes and 41 seconds, and they've also committed six turnovers. If Pete Carrill could have devised the way this game would go, you're looking at... <laughs> the results. This is the way he probably would have drawn it up. I asked Pete Carrillo yesterday if Princeton over his 23 years has always been a slow offensive team, hang on the ball and play good defense. Here's Perry with the shot. Off the mark, no the rebound. He said no, we haven't always played that way, but as the tuition at Princeton <laughs> has gone up, the Tigers' pace and tempo has gone down. A little tougher to get the quick athletes who can leap when they're paying the bulk of their tuition and other expenses. It's almost $20,000 a year now to attend Princeton when you add it all up. Well, it's tough to get olives from a fig tree. You've got to play the hand you're dealt. And Pete Carrill obviously plays it very well, as the nation certainly saw with that memorable game against Georgetown in the tournament last year. Another turnover. Doyle picked off the pass that was coming in from the wing from Savage. I tell you what, Rutgers really looking to try to throw the ball inside, but because they really don't have a dominant, proven, low-post player, they're struggling with trying to throw it inside because they've been basically a perimeter team here in the early season. Miller kept the Doyle miss alive, and Doyle has it back. We're down to 10-10 to play in the first half. Turnover's definitely the story. 10-5 the score, Princeton. Eastwick was short with the finger roll. Now the Scarlet Knights look to run. Craig Carter was fouled. The basket would not have counted. He was fouled by Leftwich on the drive. Well, that's an excellent outlet pass after the good rebound by Lee Perry. Carter excels in the open floor that time, able to draw the foul. And here's the sixth man we highlighted at the beginning of the telecast. Matt Lappin is into the basketball game. He's the sixth man out of the Red Auerbach mold. As Pete Carrill said yesterday he thinks that Lappin gives him a boost off the bench when he comes in, and he is their second leading scorer for the season. 11 points a game and 55% shooting, 50% from the three-point arc. Duncan missed off the glass. Carry the strong rebound, missed the putback. Now Savage off the glass and good. And Rutgers is up to seven points. It's now 10-7 Princeton with nine and a half minutes to play in the first half. That's one way to counter poor shooting and poor execution in your half-court offense. Pound that offensive glass. Miller working on Hughes. Was short with a shot. Rebound out of bounds off Miller and the ball goes to Rutgers. You made a good point today as we were talking about Princeton looking at their stats and how many of their players play 40 minutes a game. They've had, they have two players who've played every minute of the season. Miller's played every minute except two, but at this pace of play, they can stay in there for the whole basketball game. They can take breathers while they're out there in action. Well, their style of play certainly not one to tax your cardiovascular system simply because they aren't looking to push the ball. It's not a 94-foot game. It's more frustrating mentally because how much you have to concentrate at your defensive end in the half court, running over picks, making sure guys don't back cut, and uh, knowing that Princeton is going to use 20, 25, 30 seconds of the shot clock most of the time. Basket by Savage, made it a one-point game, 10-9 Princeton with eight and a half minutes to play in the first half. Matt Henschen. And now George Lethwich 
Jad, who mentioned an All-American at Villanova. He's now the head basketball coach at the University of the District of Columbia. Henshin, strong drive, and he lays it in to put the lead back at three points for the Tigers of Princeton. See, what happens when they spread you out so well and you're leery of the back cut? It's tough for guys away from the ball to be conscious of helping. So they kind of lull you to sleep, and then somebody dribbles down the lane for penetration. Attic is getting ready to come back into the game for Rutgers. The miss from Hughes. Princeton running for a rare time. Left which missed the layup. And off the rebound activity, Tom Savage comes back up the floor for Rutgers. Now Earl Duncan. He's a junior from Los Angeles. Hughes back to Carter. 12-9 Princeton. 7.25 to play in the first half. Duncan nearly got caught in midair. Hughes forces one up and got it from the foul line. Keith Hughes makes it a one-point game. Well, see, Rutgers would like to press after makes, but they've had so few makes, they haven't had an opportunity to press as much as they would like. Talking with Rutgers coach Bob Wenzel today, asking him if he would press. He said, I consider Georgetown to be one of the best pressing teams, if not the best, in the nation. And they weren't successful with it against Princeton, but there's no reason to think that we will be talking about Rutgers. Lappin missed his first shot attempt. Rebound, volleyball, left which came down with it. Now Henshin. And Jerry Doyle, he's a junior from Woodliff, Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey. Princeton will keep three or four guys on the perimeter and then flash somebody into the lane on occasion. After they spun you around a few times with ball reverses from one side of the floor to the other, you get a little winded and you lose concentration momentarily and then there's the back cut of the dribble penetration. Down to eight seconds on the shot clock. Tigers will have to start looking to the basket. Miller for three. No good. Lappin picked up the rebound. He was pushed. The foul is going to be called against Lee Perry. That's his first foul in the third against the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers. I would think they'd call that a shooting foul as Lappin was trying to tip that ball in when he was pushed. Well, no control. I think it's just a non-shooting foul. He really didn't have control of the basketball. You're right, and the officials are too, as usual. You got it. Official timeout. And there's a timeout on the floor with 6.07 to play in the first half. It's Princeton 12 and Rutgers 11. Back at Jadwin Gymnasium in Princeton, New Jersey, the home of the Tigers, and the Tigers have a one-point lead over their rivals from New Brunswick, New Jersey, the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. 7-1, although Rutgers has slowed down. They were piling up the turnovers at a very rapid rate at the start of the ball game. They've slowed down in that area, and they haven't scored a point off a turnover, while Princeton has half bit points off miscues by the Scarlet Knights. Miscues work two ways. One, you don't get a shot at the basket and you give the opposition an opportunity to, to add points to their total. New man in the ball game is 21, Kyle Harrington for Princeton. Rutgers goes to his own now. Little matchup zone. One, two, two. Leftwich, and this is now Harrington. 20 seconds left on the shot clock. Ten seconds left, and Leftwich puts it up, no good. Rebound controlled by Lee Perry. He's the brother of Tim Perry, now the Phoenix Suns. Craig Carter, he's in the backcourt now with Datica. It's Perry up front with Hughes and Savage for Rutgers. Savage had it in the corner. Datica, nice Great pass look. down low, Great and look. Hughes gives Rutgers the lead. Rutgers that time displayed good patience, nice penetration and dish by Datica, and that's what I think they need to do more than anything, just be a little more patient. They've been anxious to try to throw it inside after one or two passes, that time after some good ball movement, penetration, and a deuce. Hughes leads all scores with seven points, Harrington for two, and his first shot is off the mark, and the ball goes back to Rutgers. 
If you're the Scarlet Knights, Clark, is there anything you can do to speed up the tempo against Pete Carrill's club? No, you really can't. They're so good at containing and controlling the tempo that you almost just have to wait for your opportunity to put together a four, five, six, seven point run to where then they might panic. And you hope that they might panic and get out of what they like to do well, and then maybe you can capitalize on that. But in the early going, you just have to kind of fight it out until you get an opportunity to put together a couple of baskets and get the lead. Scarlet Knights did press after the field goal by Hughes. He now has nine of the 15 Rutgers points. And you saw that the Tigers broke that press rather easily. I think that pressure after the basket is more or less token pressure. If a silly turnover comes out of it, fine. But the Scarlet Knights really not looking to take the ball from you, just wanting you to use a little clock in the backcourt. Over the last six minutes, Rutgers on a 10-2 run to take a three-point lead. Tension. Second foul on Tom Savage. And the fourth called against Rutgers. Neither team in danger of going over the limit at the moment. And there's a timeout on the floor with 3.52 to play in the first half. Bob Wenzel's Rutgers Scarlet Knights have taken a three-point lead. Rutgers has taken a three-point lead over Princeton with 3.52 to play in the first half. Rutgers starting to pick it up from the floor. They're up to 44% shooting. And coming up at halftime, Chris Fowler has the scores and highlights of the important two NFL games today. Big wins for the Giants and Broncos. And Chris will also take you through NCAA scores and highlights. The Division I AA football championship was decided earlier today on ESPN. Princeton's shooting, meanwhile, is tailed off. Part of that 6 of 22 is 0 for 8 on three-point field goals. Princeton, a respectable three-point shooting team with 37% coming into the game. The 44% of the game for Rutgers is above their season average. Bob Wenzel said shooting has been their biggest problem. The Scarlet Knights came into the game shooting just 43% from the floor for the season as a team. When you lack a real dominant, proven inside score, you have to rely an awful lot on the perimeter shot, and that's what Rutgers has been doing. Lappin hits the three, first three-pointer of the ball game for Princeton, and that ties it at 15 with 3.10 to play in the first half. Lappin 12 of 24 coming into the game from behind the arc, so he's capable from there. Perry didn't get the roll off the rebound, left which the point guard for Princeton came away with it. Miller inside, now Henschen, he's been driving all night, and that drive results in a layup that gives Princeton a two-point lead. Well, you really have to close out on Henschen on balance because he takes advantage of any, anything the defender gives him, and he's looking to drive and slash to the basket. Six points for Matt Henschen, his season high 15 against Lehigh. You get a good look at the zone defense, one-two-two two, two matchup. Pass inside from Datica. That was picked off. Here comes Leftwich. Miller, double team, played it off to Henshin. Rutgers now back to man to man. They had shown a little zone. Given the style of Princeton, I asked Pete Carrillo yesterday if he was opposed to the shot clock. He wishes there was not a shot clock in college basketball. Miller is scoring. They're making a four-point lead. He said no. He said, we don't try to kill the clock and just hold on to the ball all night. We just take time to set up our offense because we're constantly looking for layups if we can get them. He said, we could really run our offense in about 35 seconds. He prefers that it is 45. <laughs> but he said it's really not a factor and not a hindrance to this Princeton team. Is very deliberate in what they do. Hughes with the miss. Perry had the offensive rebound, and Harrington knocked it away to Leftwich. For a tough break for Perry, as he was an excellent rebounding position on the weak side, had it momentarily and lost it. All five Tigers going to the defensive glass. They don't try to fast break, so those guards aren't cheating to escape down floor on offense. They're helping on the defensive glass, and that time it was the two guards who combined. Harrington knocked it away and left it pick it up. When you're not very big, everybody has to get in there and grab some rebounds for you. Clearly, Princeton not a very big team at all. 
But just to alert Chris Fowler, we're only 50 seconds away from halftime. Hard to believe. We played only about a half an hour in actual time, a very quick half, and Henson scores to give Princeton its biggest lead, 21 to 15, and the Tigers have gone on a 9-0 run. Well, this is where Princeton really becomes dangerous. Because of the way they play in their offensive execution, you have a tendency to try to cut into their leads too quickly when you're playing against them. It looks like the Scarlet Knights will look for the last shot here and try to go into the locker room down by four, three or four. Inside, Terry puts it home. With 10 seconds left, still time for Princeton if they hustle it up the floor. Pension. Baseline shot, too strong, an air ball cleared by Perry. Rutgers came into this basketball game averaging 75 points per game. They scored 17 in the first half, and Bob Wenzel's team leaves the floor, trailing Keith Carrill's Princeton Tigers 21 to 17. That's our score at the half. Now let's send you back to our studios and Chris Fowler. Okay, thank you, Sean, and thank you for your little 50-second warning there. It is a quick first half. The game definitely played at Princeton's pace, and they lead after 20 minutes. A busy day in college basketball. 21-17 oh. as Princeton Tigers have a four-point lead. Let's go back now to Sean and Clark. Thank you very much, Chris, and welcome back, everybody, to Jadwin Jim. The score very much to Princeton's liking, 21-17 to at the half. And, Clark, uh, Pete Carrill, I think we've seen how his team likes to play basketball to a tee in the first half. Some people might look at the score and say, boy, it's not a very interesting basketball game, but I think it's fascinating to watch what a disciplined team Princeton is. And as the numbers show, if they had done a little bit better job of shooting, shooting the way they normally do, they could have a bigger lead than four points right now. They really could. You look at the turnover situation, that's reflected in the field goal attempts. Princeton has taken eight more shots than Rutgers because of the opportunity, because of the turnovers. Rutgers on both teams really shooting as cold as the as the wind chill factor is outside. So it hasn't been pretty. And here we get a look at, at the points off the turnovers. Princeton with eight points. Rutgers, again, only one turnover for Princeton. And the Rutgers Scarlet Knights unable to convert that to two points. Here's a block shot by Eastwick. Savage again a little slow and loading up the trigger finger. And this is what happened at the other end after that block. Back cut by Leftwich. And he got a deuce, possibly uh, a little push by Duncan, but only two points on that one. Possibly uh, a little push by Duncan, but only two points on that one. High scores in the first half for Rutgers. Hughes had nine of the 17 points. Savage four, Duncan and Perry two apiece. For Princeton, Henshin had eight. Miller six, Leftwich four, Lappin three. And it's Rutgers basketball to start the second half. Duncan and Carter begin in the backcourt. This is Carter with the basketball. Now Savage. Savage is up front with Hughes and Terry. Carter for two, yes. And Rutgers is within two at 21-19. For a nice ball movement that time. Excellent shot. A 15-footer for a guy shooting 55% from the floor. And Rutgers has to get off to a quick start here in the second half. Starting the second half for Princeton. Harrington and Leftwich in the backcourt. Miller in the middle. Henson Lappin up front. This is Lappin. Back to Miller. And they've already taken 25 seconds off the shot clock. 20 seconds left for Princeton to take a shot. You know, we talked about Rutgers needing to be patient defensively, but I think it's going to be just as important for them to be patient with their offensive game. Pete Carrill wanted a three-pointer. It's a two-pointer for Harrington, his first basket of the night. We had one foot on the line. Batted the pass down, but Carter got it back. Savage put his shoulder down and charged into Henshin. And that's the third foul against Tom Savage. He's the only player in the game in foul trouble. That seemed to be a pretty clear-cut call. He just put his shoulder down and rammed right over Henshin. Lowered the shoulder, and that's always an offensive foul when the defender has good position. Rutgers starts out here in the man-to-man. -man. Lob inside the Miller. Wide open Harrington. Didn't get the bounce on the baseline jumper. And a foul on the rebound. Leftwich is going to be called for reaching in. 
Boy, Duncan took his field trying to come up with that pass over the top of the over the top and took his field. Here's the battle for the offense for the defensive board. Hughes doing a nice job. He averages 11 and a half boards per game. There you saw the foul by Leftwich. His second, first on the Tigers in the second half. 18-21 to play. It's a four-point Princeton lead at 23 to 19, and a steal by Lappin. Really just a poor pass. Rutgers really trying to probe it inside, but they're telegraphing passes, and they're not being aggressive and assertive with their passes. A lot of lazy passes into the post area. Both coaches played down the importance of this rivalry. Rutgers coach Bob Wenzel said Seton Hall is really their bigger interstate rival. And Pete Carrill said Princeton and Rutgers was a bigger rivalry in football. They stopped playing each other in football. There's three for Lappin from well beyond the three-point line. And it's 26-19 Princeton, the Tigers' biggest lead of the basketball game. Well, you know how coaches can undersell things, but clearly to the student body here, to the Ivy League, this would be a huge win for Princeton, and we can't let anybody tell us this. Mm -hmm. It certainly is a more important game for Princeton. Rutgers... Well, it's almost a no-win situation for Rutgers. Mm -hmm. They're almost expected to win it, and if they don't, then it's a major asterisk on their record. When you look at the Rutgers schedule, rated by the Sporting News, the fifth toughest schedule in the country. <laughs> that can work a couple of different ways. One, if you're impressive in playing a tough schedule, and obviously a stronger team, but it also can be hard on you to lose some of those games. Textbook Princeton offense, and Miller had the uncontested layup. It's 28-21. If you look at that schedule, you can understand why it might be tough for this Rutgers team to get fired up to play Princeton. They've already played Syracuse and Seton Hall. They have Notre Dame coming up. Missouri, a game you'll see on ESPN. St. John's. In addition to their Atlantic 10 schedule, which includes Temple twice, so they have some marquee names on their schedule, and it might be tough to get pumped up to play the Princeton Tigers. Duck it back into the basketball game. Perry goes out. The foul was on Lappin his first, and Craig Carter is at the foul line with 16.36 to play in the second half. Well, that's an excellent point you make about them having their intensity level up for this game tonight. They had a tough loss against Seton Hall at home, exciting and electric atmosphere and then to come into, into this place which although it's smaller clearly the fans are into it but again Princeton not the same caliber of team mm -hmm. of a seat call and, and you have that tendency to uh, to let up now plenty of arc on the free throws from Carter he got both of them it's now a five point game and the press for Rutgers left which will bring it up Certainly, if you don't come in to this place with intensity, it's tough to pick up the intensity during the game because Princeton lulls you to sleep. Foul away from the ball, and it was on Duckett as he bumped into Miller underneath. Rutgers really has to work at maintaining their poise. It's only a five-point deficit right now. Mike Jones comes in for the first time, and Tom Savage, with, with his three fouls, goes out. Foul against Duckett. Well, Duckett was his first. And the second on the team in the second half. Miller, a wise play. He was double teamed and threw it out off Duncan. Well, Bob Wenzel trying to go with a smaller, more active unit. Mike Jones, part of that solution. Jones, a freshman from Morrisville, Pennsylvania. Hasn't played much this year. Lappin inside the Miller. Henshin down low. That was deflected in route. And it will stay with Princeton. The officials conferred. The official underneath, Jerry Salvato wasn't sure. He conferred with Jim Potter. And Bob Wenzel didn't like the conference and the result of it. Well, from this angle, it looked like that ball may have touched Harrington. Miller, one-on-one -on, -one on Duckett, had it blocked from behind by Hughes. A rare fast break for the Scarlet Knights, and Duncan converts. It's now a three-point game. Princeton leads 28-25. For oh, excellent decision that time by Duncan. Under very good control, got it into the lane, and just pulled up with a nice on-balance jump. Now the Rutgers fans trying to get into it. They brought a nice contingent with them. 
And there's a timeout on the court. Princeton 28, Rutgers 25. We'll return to Jadwin Jim in Princeton right after this. We're back in Princeton, New Jersey. The Tigers with a three-point lead, but for a rare time tonight, Rutgers able to run. Good defense often can lead to good offense. There you see the help side blocked by Hughes. Now the excellent decision by Earl Duncan in transition for the little pull-up J. Just four points for Earl Duncan in the basketball game. But the bucket took the lead down to three for Princeton. <laughs> it's kind of tough to maintain your average when you play against <laughs> a team like Princeton. You come in averaging 14, 15, 16 points a game. Oh. Henson with the reverse layup along the baseline makes it 30 to 25. Boy, Henson really active in going to the basket, whether it be on back cuts or on dribble penetration. Rutgers going to have to do it defensively. Because five minutes into the second half, they have just 25 points. Jones missed his first shot. Offensive rebound missed by Hughes. Carter. Short off the glass. Duckett was fouled on the floor. He was fouled as he came down with the rebound. Looks like Jerry Doyle is going to pick up the foul. And he does. <laughs> Are you going to look at Coach Carrill? I asked him about the Georgetown game and the loss, the tough loss that captured the nation's attention of the tournament last year. He said, I think I set a coaching record for being congratulated the most after a loss. <laughs> <laughs> Carter. Too strong, and again, it's Hughes with the offensive rebound. He was fouled on the shot. Keith Hughes has been the main man for Rutgers tonight. Leftwich committed the foul. Here you get to look at both coaches. Pete Carrill, his worst fear coming true here the last two possessions. Rutgers exerting themselves on the offensive glass. The second time they get an opportunity for free throws, Keith Hughes doing a nice job inside. Rick Dalica back in. Hughes with 11 points and five rebounds. Hughes sat out last year, but even in the year he was at Syracuse, did not play very much. So in essence, he's suffering from a two-year layoff, and he's got a lot of talent. Can shoot it from outside, can play inside, but he's basically a perimeter guy that can occasionally go inside. He's not very big, but he's active, good leg, and really is going to be an excellent player as he irons out the kinks in his game. Back down to a three-point Princeton lead with 14.40 to play. Leftwich bumped by Datica. Nearly 10 in the backcourt. They Whoa. just did cross the line with one second left. I really think pressure now is important for Rutgers. They have to be active defensively. They just can't allow Princeton to really do what they want to do offensively. Now is the time to gamble, be aggressive, and try to force them out of what they're doing. Lappin hits for three. Back to a six-point lead. The people watching at home might be saying, Rutgers has the faster athlete, the better athlete. Why don't they extend that man-to-man -man out and play right in their face and play aggressively? But if they do, then Princeton goes to that pat in the back door attack. You're almost doing what Princeton wants you to do. As a defensive unit, you only can take away so much. And good offensive teams exploit what you give them, whether it's the perimeter shot, whether it's back cuts and overplaying, opens up back cut lanes. And Princeton does such a great job of keeping the floor spread. Here you get a look at it from the wide angle shot. And they just do a nice job of keeping things spread. And then after 20, 20 seconds of moving your feet, being active with your hands, hey, you get a little tired playing defense. That time you saw a duck it all the way out, well beyond the top of the key on Miller. Ten seconds left in the shot clock. Miller in the three star of night. And now foul the second time. The crowd wanted to call the first time Miller went up, and there was plenty of contact. Certainly a foul could have been called on somebody. There was a foul on the kickback by Miller, and the foul charged to Keith Hughes, his first. Well, here we look at it. All five Scarlet Knights around Miller. It's amazing he even gets that shot up. Good block. Then the push by Keith Hughes inside. I initially thought that could have been called against Miller, but Hughes was still moving. Miller makes the first one. He came into the game beating 154 points, become the 18th 
Princeton player to reach 1,000 points for his career. And as a junior, he's on pace to go over 1,500 for his career, and only Bill Bradley in Princeton history has reached that mark. Five-point game, Princeton with the lead, Hughes, yes. Oh, a nice little pass that time by Tom Savage as he flashed high. Tigers want a technical foul ball. They felt like Dada could knock the ball out of the hands of Leftwich out of bounds. And now the officials are conferring on that subject. 17 points now for Keith Hughes. And it is going to be a technical. You cannot knock the ball out of the hands of the player who is standing out of bounds trying to inbound it. And apparently that's what Dada did. Hey, Two-shot technical, Henshin will shoot it. He came in as an 85% free-throw shooter. And he also shot 85% from the line last year, so he's the right man. And of course, if we say that, he misses the first one. <laughs> Never fails. Bob Wenzel is going to send Earl Duncan into the game. Henshin made one of two. Princeton leads by four with 13.01 to play. Duncan's coming in for Datica. I tell you what, Hughes doing a great job here in the second half. Well, he had nine at the half, so he's just kind of picked it up from there, showing you his versatility at the offensive end. Hughes has 17 of Rutgers' 31 points. The Princeton Tigers attack has been more balanced than that, and they have a four-point lead with 13 minutes to play. It was 21-17, Princeton at the half. Danger of the five count, Lappin gave it off to Henson. They had only taken 14 seconds off the clock, so that <laughs> would have been too quick for Henson to pump it up. A little weave out front. Gary Doyle for three. You know, when they knock down the perimeter shot, it really makes it tough to defend them because then the back door lanes are more open. Duncan forced it inside, and Hughes there again. 19 points now for Keith Hughes. Well, I don't know how he slithered that one up on the glass. Clearly under the basket and still found a way to get it up and down. Princeton by five. 12.05 to play. Doyle and Leftwich now the backcourt for Princeton. Still lapping. Miller and Henshin up front. He took with the force early, but we haven't seen him since then. Hughes blocked Miller's attempted hook, and it goes out of bounds to the Tigers of Princeton. We'll take a break with 11.52 to play. Princeton leads by five. 11.52 to play. Princeton has a five-point lead over the defending Atlantic 10 tournament champions. A little bit of the positive and the negative. Four Rutgers, 10 turnovers the negative, but Hughes has been the brightest spot for the Scarlet Knights with his 19 points. Princeton capitalizing for eight points off turnovers, all of those in the first half, however, and Henshin has 11. Talk about degree of difficulty. Here's Hughes having a tough time. Then look at this shot. I mean, he's clearly, his whole body is underneath the hoop, actually underneath the backboard, and he still was able to extend and get it up and down. Only two turnovers for Rutgers here in the second half. Hughes knocked the inbound pass back out of bounds. Princeton will try again. That reminded me of you, Clark, from your playing days. That shot. Well, I, I, had a ten, I, I had the ability to be a little creative underneath mm -hmm. the hole on the case. Yes, sure. indeed you did. As I'm sure our fans will remember. <laughs> Lappin to Leftwich. Five-point Princeton lead. Miller took it in the trap and was fouled. Looked like when he first handed it, he had an open shot. Took it a little bit closer and drew the foul. Hughes picks up the foul. His second. There you see the tail end as Hughes tried to go over the top for the steal, and then he comes back into the play. There's the lob over Hughes, and now he's recovering. Leaves his feet, and that's, that's a no-no. When that happens, usually you're going to pick up the foul defensively. Hughes, though, has been outstanding. 19 points, 19 of 33. Rutgers points for Hughes. 
Miller's a good foul shooter. 70% for the season. And he just picked up his 10th point of the night, giving Princeton a six-point lead. He had 21 points to lead the Tigers last year against Rutgers. That game was close all the way and run won by Rutgers on their home floor. A little high-low game here, Savage. I'm looking for you. Oh, nice move. Power drive by Tom Savage, and it's back to a five-point lead. Tension. Open is Miller. Boy, Mike Jones really trying to put pressure on the Tigers' guards in the backcourt. More aggressive man-to-man -man defense now for Rutgers. Tension had Jones right in his face. Down to 20 on the shot clock. And the left was besides that plenty of time. Takes a score to midcourt. Back door. Henshin couldn't handle it, but they ruled that it went off Mike Jones. 12 seconds left on the shot clock. Well, that's pretty good defense by Rutgers to make the recovery on the back door cut. Princeton will lift three or four guys above the free throw line and then send one guy on the back door cut, trying to alleviate that weak side help. Five seconds left. Miller fouled again. This time Earl Duncan hit him. See, right now, Keith Hughes is trying to go over the top on the lob to Kit Miller. I think, see, Hughes is going to try to go over the top. See that? I think Hughes can play behind Miller. Miller's going to try to roll that little hook into the lane, but play behind him and then get some help from over the top because otherwise what's happened the last two possessions is going to continue to happen. Kit Miller. He led the Ivy League last year. 11th in the nation field goal shooting at 65%. Impressive. He does a pretty good job for a guy not big and not real quick and doesn't have a tremendous bounce. He uses his body well, and then with the floor spread, he's a lot of times able to go one on one and get his shots off in the paint. Miller's also been the leading scorer for Princeton in four of their first five games, and he's leading the attack again tonight. Seven-point Princeton lead, 42-35. We approach the midway point of the second half. Carter was way off balance, and Henshin came down with the rebound. Well, it seems as though Carter may have gotten nudged a little bit. Off-balance shot, but no call. didn't like that call. He's walking away from the action and now turns back to it. And Hughes, who wasn't in foul trouble at all at the half, has picked up three here in the second half. And Bobby Wenzel wants a timeout. 9.54 to play at Jadwin Gym in Princeton, New Jersey. The homestanding Tigers have a seven-point lead. Kit Miller kind of on a little roll here, the last three possessions for Princeton. Here he's got it in the post. Hughes plays behind him, which is nice, but here he leaves his feet on a nice ball fake that time by Miller, and then a foul called on Hughes, and Miller back at the line. He's been setting up shop there lately. Princeton's field goal shooting has really improved in the second half, but Rutgers has picked it up as well, and these two teams have now scored as many points as they did in the entire first half in the first 10 minutes and 6 seconds of the second half. It was 21-17 at the break, and now with that free throw by Miller, it's 43-35, Princeton. Well, the accuracy is picked up, as we just mm -hmm. saw there. Both teams frigid in the first half. One out of two for Miller. Eight-point lead for the Tigers of Princeton with 9.50 to play. This is the biggest lead of the game for Princeton. Earl Dungeon in the lane, yes. Oh. <laughs> Shake and bake on him, Earl. Oh, a nice little individual move that time by Duncan. Doyle had two seconds to spare as he brought it across midcourt, guarded all the way by Carter. Princeton goes into the weave, and it's Doyle bringing it out to midcourt. So they keep four guys on the perimeter, and then Miller will sneak inside and try to get it one-on-one. -on -one and Usually Savvy and Ball plays in there to try to draw fouls. And because Princeton has started to shoot the ball a little better, you can't afford to leave their spot-up shooters on the perimeter. Ten seconds on the shot clock. Miller. 
Dukes with five seconds and a quick. Excellent defense that time by Hughes. 8.50 to play. Six point lead for Princeton. Earl Duncan. And now Carter. They are in the backcourt. Jones, Hughes, and Savage, the front line for the Scarlet Knights. Duncan stopped in traffic and was fouled. Boy, Duncan showed you some of his strength there as he got into the lane. Really didn't have an opening, but strong enough with the basketball to hang on to it as he was fouled. Matt Lappin picked up the foul, his second. Rick Datica is back into the ball game for Craig Carter. That was a break for Duncan as he stopped in traffic, had white shirts all around him, but was fouled. Duncan again. Now Jones from the foul line. Nice shot by Mike Jones. I'll tell you what, he's been quietly effective. That's his first hoop. But he's been active defensively, putting pressure on the basketball. And he's been part of the turnaround for the Scarlet Knight. And he'll be one of the few, if not the only, Rutgers player to improve his scoring average. He came in averaging 1.8 points per game. <laughs> Eight minutes to play. Princeton leads by four. That was the Tigers' lead at the half. The lob, this time Hughes, who was fronting again, picked it off. Rutgers trying to pull him in a bucket. Savage was fouled on the floor. No basket, but the foul is on Miller. <laughs> Boy, because Savage cleared out. Uh, there's, there's a look at Pete Carrillo. Here's the pass into the posting Savage. Now he's just going to clear out mm. Mill Miller. But the foul was whistled on. On Miller, his second. On the reach in. Denver with the big win today, and the New York Giants, the other winner in the NFL. Hughes, he just cannot miss tonight. Keith Hughes. 22 points now, and it's a one-point lead, as that was a three-point basket for Keith Hughes. 43-42, and Rutgers is on a 7-0 run. minutes to play. 20 on the shot clock. Henson hasn't shot in a while. He is fouled by Jones as he passed off. And both sides are now over the limit. Neither side reached the limit in fouls in the first half. They're both over the limit with 6.54 to play. Here in the second half, Princeton has seen its lead shrink to one. His best free throw shooter, Matt Hedgen. He was offered a Moorhead scholarship, a very prestigious scholarship at the University of North Carolina, as was Matt Eastwick, and they both turned him down to come here to Princeton and pay for every penny of their education. There's a lot about those two guys. I had an interesting chat yesterday with Pete Carrill talking about coaching Ivy Leaguers. I said, well, it must be easy to coach these intelligent guys. He said, no, a lot of times it's much more difficult because being smart in the classroom has nothing to do with being smart on the court. And a lot of times these good students lack the natural basketball instincts. They don't play as much basketball as some of their opponents. What I like to call a feel for the game, which can't be taught. It has to be learned and acquired. And the only way that happens is through playing constantly against all types of competition in different places and uh, excellent point by coach Carrillo that some of these kids that are you know, really bright in the classroom and vice versa you've got a lot of guys that excel in basketball knowledge and don't ha and have a tough time in the classroom just saw Lappin and coach Carrillo said he really is the closest player on his team to having that natural basketball instinct Jones has been a story for Rutgers off the bench. Look at him high on the basketball. Look at him high on the basketball. Forced the turnover there. Credit that to Mike Jones. I didn't see who was on the other side denying the inbounds pass, but Jones has been doing it since he stepped on the floor. 
And it's the folks from New Brunswick, New Jersey making the noise at the moment. The five-second call gives the ball back to Rutgers. They trail by one with 6.14 to play. They have not led in the second half. Rutgers has shut off the turnovers while Princeton has committed a couple. At one time, that margin was 10 to one. Now it's 10 to three. And here's a near steal by Henschen and a foul called. Duncan committed the foul as he held Henschen, and Henschen will go to the line one and one after the second foul committed by Earl Duncan. Well, I tell you what, Danica and Duncan both thought the other was going to come up with the loose ball right here in front of us, and neither one did, and that allowed Henschen to come up with it, and then Duncan fouled him. And Dadica goes to the bench, replaced by Craig here Carter. Get, here we get a look at what I'm talking about. See, Duncan and Dadica both thought the other guy was going to do it, and nobody did, and Henson able to squeeze in between them and draw the foul. Matt Henson at the line. He's not the only standout athlete in his family. His younger brother, Brian, age 11, is a two-time Massachusetts State Special Olympics swimming champion. Well, I'll tell you what, talk about courage and heart and dedication and inspiration. I've had an opportunity in Indiana to work with the Indiana Special Olympics, and those athletes can teach you an awful lot about determination and dedication. Three-point lead for Princeton. Jerry Doyle called for a foul for sticking his leg out. And that'll be a one-on-one -on -one for Mike Jones. Bobby Wenzel in his second year as head coach at his alma mater said the expectations are very high because of the Cinderella season they had last year. Expectations weren't high for Rutgers a year ago, and yet they upset Temple en route to the Atlantic 10 tournament title and battled Iowa tooth and nail till the end of the ball game in the first round of the NCAA tournament before losing to the Hawkeyes. Again, that coach's seat is a hot one, especially when you add two transfers from Syracuse and you have the kind of season that the Scarlet Knights had a year ago. The media and fans sometimes get a little too euphoric about the team situation and expect too much from the team. Bob Wenzel says they're going to play a tough schedule, but they need to be on television to get the exposure to attract recruits, especially when he's recruiting primarily in the backyard of the Big East. Well, I admire him for the schedule he's playing. I'm sure he'd like to see his team fare well with that time. The hook by Miller, and Princeton has moved its lead back up to five at 49-44 with 5-12 to play. Princeton keeping the Knights at bay. Get Miller now with 16 points. His given name, by the way, is Christopher Miller. Spelled like Mueller, but pronounced Miller. Duncan, nice speed down low, and Savage was fouled by Miller as he went up for the shot. Nice look that time by Duncan. Every possession now a key one for the Scarlet Knights. Princeton very much in control right now because they like this position. They've got a little cushion, and they've been able to execute fairly well on their half-court offense. They've picked up their shooting. Rutgers is just going to have to stay here. We're going to look at Duncan. Nice little lob here to Savage from Duncan. And then Miller came over and committed the foul. Savage connects on the first one. He came into the game as a 71% free throw shooter. Just seven points for Savage, well below his season average of 15 and a half points per ball game. You know what I'm impressed with Savage is that he hasn't really tried to force it. Henshin breaks the press. They had a two on one for the moment, but Lappin pulls it back out. They never yield to the temptation to force it at the basket, even if, though, even if they seem to have a man advantage. Well, with the lead and the basketball, playing pretty well in their half-court offense, Pete Carrillo's unit very content to milk some clock and come up with a high percentage shot. Time becoming a factor now, 4.23 to play. Three-point lead for Princeton, and they're down to 15 seconds left in the shot clock. Left wedge in traffic. for the shot and was fouled a five-point lead for Princeton and Leftwich has a chance to make it six. Well again look at the gamble here by Duncan he leaves his man that allows Leftwich to get to the lane and Savage coming over to help 
really wasn't aggressive in helping, but that created by the gamble. And again, we talked about patience defensively. The Scarlet Knights have done a pretty good job, and Duncan decides to just randomly leave and double the ball, and that opened up the lane. And the foul on Savage was his fourth. Six-point Princeton lead. Carter drive. Lock the call. The basket is good. And Miller can't believe it. That is his fourth foul. So the big men on both sides now picking up the fouls. Miller has four for Princeton. Savage with four for Rutgers. And the bucket by Carter makes it a four-point game. Coming right at you, folks. Craig Carter driving, slashing. Oh, Miller looked like he got there from that angle. Maybe moving just a bit. But again, the rule of the point of emphasis is that verticality and if the defensive player has gotten there, and he's supposed to get a benefit of the doubt. Jones bumps Henson. Pete Carrill still yelling about what he thought was the offensive foul at the other end. Jones picks up his second foul. Well, I tell you what, on the play. excuse me, John, but Mike Jones has really come in and done a nice job. He's been active and aggressive. There you see Coach Wenzel signaling for a timeout. And he's granted. Princeton 52, Rutgers 49. We'll return for the final 401 right after this. They don't have fraternities and sororities here on the Princeton campus. They have social clubs, and these folks are members of the Colonial Club, which is an eating club, we're told. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Quite dressed up to be, to be headed somewhere to eat. They have a social function tonight, obviously a formal function, and they have slipped away <laughs> to come to the game. We're told that they're heading back for their formal function after the game, and they'll go with smiles on their faces if the Tigers can protect this three-point lead. Bob Wenzel spent a year as an assistant coach to Dave Wool with the New Jersey Nets before becoming head coach at his alma mater. And before his year with the Nets, he was head coach at Jacksonville. Matt Henschen, one and one, as he tries to build on the Tigers' three-point lead with 4.01 to play. Sean McDonough along with Clark Kellogg. Game one of our doubleheader coming up at the conclusion of our game, another backyard battle between Georgia Tech and Georgia. From the Omni in Atlanta, Ron Franklin and Larry Conley standing by to bring you that one. Henson has been impressive from the strike as well as from the floor. He's been active offensively, slashing and cutting to the basket, even putting it on the floor. 17 points for Henson. Well above his average of 10 per game coming in. Rainbow <laughs> goes again for Hughes. 24 now for Keith Hughes, and that's a career high. Boy, Miller and Hughes really going at it, getting to know each other down there. Miller looked like he was thinking about that hook that's gone for him a couple of times tonight, but the Tigers with the lead want to run that clock down. Still 25 seconds on the shot clock. 3.20 on the game clock. Tigers by three. came down with it and knocked down was Carter, but there was no call. No fracture, no foul. Oh, throw away by Carter. He was looking underneath for Savage, and I think he thought Savage was going to go up for an alley-oop type pass, and he didn't, and Carter just sailed it over his head. Boy, a crucial turnover after the good defensive stance. You want to come down. There's a turnover. There's only four of those 12 turnovers for Rutgers here in the second half, but that last one, a big one as the clock winds down, Every possession is critical. Third foul on Duncan, and no question about that one, as he was reaching in on Leftwich, who's back at the free throw line. One for one from the line tonight is Leftwich. Now two for two. Eight points for Leftwich, the most he has scored since he had a career-high 12 points in the opening game of the season for the Tigers against Franklin and Marshall. And he's approaching that career high. Now it's nine, and the lead is back to five for Princeton, and time running out on Rutgers. 2.47 to play. 
Rutgers needs to get quick shots, but they need to be good quick shots. Duncan for three. <laughs> Can't get it much better than that. Quick and good. Two and a half minutes to play. A two-point Princeton lead. Tension. Miller way up high, and he brings Hughes out there with him. Princeton going to look to milk the clock much as they've been doing most of the night. Come up with a good shot. Hughes called for a hit on Miller. Four fouls now on Hughes. So two big men in foul trouble. Four for Hughes and four for Savage. Four records. And Miller, a good foul shooter, goes to the line. Here he is active. He's getting a little too aggressive with the hands. He's reached in four or five times already, and then finally, the official says, I've had enough, and he came right across the arms. But the, the Scarlet Knights really didn't need a foul there. They wanted to play good pressure defense, but there's still enough time on the clock to where if you get a hold, you're only down two with an opportunity to tire go ahead. Instead, they're down three right now. They're making it even four. 18 points for Miller, and a four-point Tiger lead with 2.13 to play. Carter to Duncan. A hold called on Doyle. Doyle came rushing at him because he knows Duncan is a good three-point shooter. And Duncan took it down and tried to drive around him, and Doyle had to grab him. as he got tangled up with Carter. Words being exchanged now between Carter. Well, well Princeton nice. folks thought that Carter was on Henshin's back. <laughs> well, we got the call from the official. <laughs> Ed Badagowski right in front of us said that Henshin grabbed onto Carter's leg for the second personal. <laughs> he call. actually said tackle. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> Big three throws here. Scarlet Knights get a break if Duncan had missed the front end of the one and one. Carter, an excellent free throw shooter with those high arcing shots, came in at 83% from the line. And he's improved on that with four for four tonight. Two point game with 2.04 to play. Princeton by two. And Mike Jones. Boy, he's done a nice job defensively. Rutgers now needs good defense, no foul, and possession. Leftwich had trouble on the dribble, was double teamed and fouled by Duncan. Four on Duncan to go along with the four on Hughes and the four on Savage. Boy, tough break here. They've got him doubled right on the sideline. It's almost like a three-man trap now. And I've yet to see the foul on Duncan. Might have been on Jones. Perhaps they tagged the wrong man. Jones seemed to be in closer contact with the left, which then did Duncan. But the foul's on Duncan, and that's a big call because, as you mentioned, it's his fourth. Well, in other words, it wasn't quite a phantom foul. Then you think well, I don't know. We, we were both watching Duncan, and I wasn't really watching Jones to see if he fouled him or not, but I would agree with you. It didn't look like Duncan did him at all. The free throw shooting contest now. Leftwich missed. Princeton ball. And now Ed Badagowski disagrees, so there'll be a jump ball, and the Princeton bench is going bananas. Oh, oh. Coach, oh. Coach Pete Carrill was making a fist as if to say he wants to sock the official right in the mouth. He's, <laughs> he's had the glasses come off. On the alternating... Oh, oh. <laughs> look like he was going to do a Bobby Knight imitation and fire the chair. He's ready to shake out of that sweater. A big call because on the alternating possession, the ball goes to Rutgers. And the steal, Lappin went diving in and deflected it to Doyle, and Princeton gets it back, and Pete Carrill's a bit calmer at the moment. Boy, that was a great defensive play. Tough passing angle that time by Jones from the free throw line into the middle of the low post. It was a tough pass to make against his own defense. A minute 28 to play. A two-point Princeton lead, Lappin the layup on the feed from Miller. Well, that's what they're noted for, lifting you up and then cutting behind you and executing the back door. 
perfectly. Time out Rutgers. With a minute 16 to play, and the Scarlet Knights trail by four. Bob Wenzel plots the strategy, and we'll be right back. Well, Clark, we talked earlier, after really the question, why doesn't Rutgers play a more aggressive man-to-man? -man? This is why. Well, you see all four other players lift it, and that opens up the lane for... Opens up the lane. It was lapping with the layup. Lapping with the layup. Again, they lifted up the defenders. Rutgers in a position where they have to overplay, have to be aggressive. And Princeton able to execute the back door perfectly. In the first half, when the situation wasn't dire, they could sit back and play the softer man to man. But now, with a minute 15 to go, they can't let Princeton take the 45 seconds off the clock. So they pressure, and the back door cut gives Princeton a four point lead. We're down to a minute eight to play now. Now they can't afford to use too much clock now. Probably trying to spring Duncan for a tray. Jones is passed deflected, and it's a turnover. Henshin with it. Looks like Jones is trying to foul him, but the whistle never blew. We're down to 50 seconds to play. They better get on the foul stick now. The four-point game. Possession in the basket does no good if they allow Princeton to use a lot of this clock. 14 turnovers for Rutgers. Princeton has committed only three, and there's the foul on the push by Jones, and he fouled the best free-throw shooter for Princeton, Henshin. Three Boy, fouls now on Mike Jones. Boy, as well as Jones has played, here we look at the free-throw percentages. Both teams shooting it respectively. As you look at, if you've got a chance to take a look at Mike Jones, he gets ready to step off. Dadica replaces him. Jones did such a nice job with his defensive pressure, but he also committed a couple of costly turnovers for his ball club. And, and he's a young player, and you just have to chalk those up to, to experience and put him in your file and learn from him as you go forward. Henshin is now 8 of 9 from the line. Dadek is back in there for Jones, probably because he's an excellent 3-point shooter, and Jones is not a 3-point specialist. Well, you talk about Jones learning from his mistakes. I'm sure that's the last thing any Rutgers fan or player would want to hear right now. 5-point game. Dadek are calling out a play. They don't have much time to set up. They have to attack, trailing by 5 with 26 seconds left now. Duncan... Been fouled as he took the three. And Henshin looked at the official Jim Potter and said, Ooh, I can't believe you called that foul, but he did, and it's a big one. If Duncan goes to the line for two, Henshin has his third personal. Here we take a look at it. Duncan working himself free. Ooh, must have been a touch. Must have been the fingernail. Looked like he might have hit on the left arm, the man shooting arm for Earl Duncan. I mentioned a moment ago, Duncan is an excellent free throw shooter. That time he didn't make a liar out of us. The Rutgers now, if they can get the second shot to go in, they'll pressure immediately and they would have to foul almost immediately if they don't come up with the steal on the inbound. Duncan the miss, lapping the rebound. Dalga knocked him down one and one immediately says the official, Jerry Salvato, right on top of the play. Here's the rebound on the miss. Vatica got everything, got his money's worth on mm -hmm. that one. But if you make the attempt to play the ball, and Vatica did appear to be reaching in to swipe, swipe the ball away, they really are not supposed to call it an intentional foul, even though it's pretty clear he was trying to commit a foul. Perry into the game. Carter is out. With 22 seconds left. Big free throws for Matt Lappin with his team leading by four. Rector's never really, really able to get control of this one. They made some runs, but never really able to get enough of a cushion to keep Princeton from playing their type of game. Now they really have to shoot a three-pointer. Savage throws up the three. Got it! And Rutgers calls a timeout with 14 seconds left. The three-pointer by Savage. And for a big fella, he can shoot the three-pointers. He had made 12 out of 33 attempts coming into tonight's game. So Rutgers plots the strategy trailing by three with 14 seconds left. 
it's kind of a no-brainer. You got to deny the inbound pass, try to come up with the steal. Here's a tough three-pointer by Savage just a moment ago to put Rutgers in this position. They trail by three, so you deny the inbound pass, try to get a five-second counter or turnover. If not, you immediately have to make an effort to play the ball and commit a foul to stop the clock. And you. There's a three-point shooting percentage. Rutgers took 33 pointers the other night, and they've only cranked up five tonight. But I think in their effort to get the ball inside early, they really forced the issue and didn't didn't execute well in their half-court offense. But maybe they should have probed inside and tried to shoot some perimeter shots early. Um, tonight they've really cut back on the three-point attempt. And you saw that they are out of timeouts. So that could be a problem if they score a basket with less than five seconds to play. They cannot stop it, and Princeton could just stay out of bounds. Coming up in just a matter of moments, from the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia Tech against Georgia. Georgia Tech has found one of the most exciting players in the country, the point guard Kenny Anderson. <laughs> They've also got Dennis Scott, a slimmer, leaner version of Dennis Scott. He's been outstanding. What a game he had against Pitt here on ESPN in the ACC Big East Challenge. Eight seconds left. Carter was going after the ball, but again, they got the ball to Henshin, the best free throw shooter. You have to think if Henshin makes one of these, the ball game's over because Rutgers would have to come down and score in less than three seconds. They can't stop the clock at the timeout. If they don't score in three seconds, they can't stop it, and Princeton would just hold the ball out of bounds. Well, really, I think Rutgers is looking to foul a little sooner than they actually did. I think Hughes had an opportunity to commit a foul on the backcourt and let some valuable time get away by not doing so. Pete Carrill has used one of his remaining timeouts. He still has three left. Foul, by the way, on Carter was his second. Eight seconds to play. Princeton with a 63 to 60 lead. They have to hope for a miss and come down and make the three-point shot. That's it. <laughs> Coming up Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, the Seattle Seahawks play host to Bo Jackson of the Los Angeles Raiders. The Raiders eyeing the playoffs, but the Seahawks over the last couple of weeks have played the role of spoiler for a couple of other teams, Cincinnati and Buffalo, trying to get into the postseason play. So that should be an exciting one from the always noisy kingdom. Now for Pete Carrill, what do you say? Matt, make those free throws and let's go home and celebrate. Most coaches usually don't even talk about free throws in a situation like that. You know what's happening if you're the shooter. Your team knows, so no need to, to reiterate it in the huddle. I think he's talking about what they do after he makes the free throw. Pete Carrill in his 23rd year at Princeton. They've had other big wins over the years. They've defeated schools like North Carolina and Ohio State. Now they take it Tension on the line. Perhaps a chance to put it away as the Tigers lead by three with eight seconds left. Rutgers is out of timeout. That should do it. Because even if Rutgers hits the three, they can't stop the clock, and they'd have to hit that three within three seconds. Five-point Princeton lead. Datica with the miss, rebound batted around. That's it. Princeton wins. The Battle of New Jersey goes to Princeton, 65-60 the final. For Clark Kellogg, Sean McDonough saying so long. Once again, here's Chris Fowler. Okay, thank you, Sean. As they pour on the floor now at Princeton, good win for Pete Carrillo's team. And in the last week now, we've seen Rutgers lose to their two rivals in New Jersey, Seton Hall and now Princeton.